Hello and welcome to our 18th lecture recap on ACCIP 7 Advanced Audit and Assurance. This is the second of our lectures on assurance services. More particularly we're looking at socio-environmental audits and prospective financial information. So first of all our socio-environmental audit. The importance of these at the minute is extremely high especially if we can see what's happening with the BP oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. So the importance will surround things like the media coverage of socio-environmental issues, the reputation risk that that involves, very plain to see from the oil spill that we see at the minute, uh, legislation that's in place, you know, complying with that legislation. Investors now are becoming much more interested in this type of area. In fact, several funds have been set up just to invest in uh, ethical investments. Customer sensitivity, again, the consumer now is much more interested in this type of area. Also there are pressure from lobbyists, you know, Greenpeace, all of these types of lobbyists will be putting pressure on businesses. So companies develop internal guidelines that they must adhere to and this means that maybe you have to come in and say, well, did they actually adhere to the guidelines that they've set out for themselves? So socio-environmental audits may encompass many different areas. Uh, the training of employees, health and safety, environmental compliance, sourcing of materials, sustainability of your sources, remuneration policy, tied into that your child labour policies in different countries, emissions policies, ethics, human rights, charitable donations. So any of these areas could come up under socio-environmental audit. So when you're reporting in these areas, well, there are some difficulties. The first of these is that many of these are very subjective. It's not like the ICES where you have a set set of guidelines and you can just apply them. So it's very subjective and variable standards. For example, there may be external standards that they try to adhere to, or they may, as I've mentioned, be internal guidelines. But either way, you need to be sure of what you're actually measuring against. I remember that you are an auditor with uh, experience in financial areas, not necessarily in the areas of socio-environmental auditing. So you need to be sure that you're not being asked to do anything that you don't have the skills and experience to do. So be careful on that as well. How do you do it? Well, you may do it by benchmarking against the best in the industry or the market leaders. And the considerations that you'll have to have when it comes to this it may be high risk. For example, nuclear areas or oil and gas, any of these areas will be high risk. If you're giving assurance, you need to be very sure that um, you have met all the targets and been uh, very careful in the work that you've carried out. This may also feed into the actual financial accounts because there may be provisions for things like site restoration. There may be contingent liabilities for cleanups or for litigation. Or there may be impairment of assets or cleanup costs that you have to actually undertake. So uh, the auditor has to be very careful that these uh, are reflected in the accounts as well. So it's not just socio-environmental and uh, assurance engagements, but also this may feed through to the financial audit. There may also pr product risks. You may have to redesign products or products may no longer be viable because of environmental legislation. So the sorts of procedures that you can undertake to, to do an audit in this sort of area, you need to understand the issues. Remember you have to have the skills and experience, so you need to be able to understand the issues that have come up. You'll inquire of management as to the risks that they've identified and the controls that they have in place to try and control those risks. You'll get management representations that they've given you all the information and that they have those controls in place. And you may need to use the work of external experts Remember, if you don't have the expertise in the area, you'll need to get someone in who does. So you'll need to gather evidence like any other audit, and you'll have to use your judgment. You'll review the minutes of board meetings to make sure that there's nothing in there that you should be aware of. And you'll check the disclosures in the accounts. So anything you find, make sure it's disclosed in the accounts. Some of these may actually feed through into a going concern issue. So if there's a, a large amount of litigation regarding something, or a large cleanup cost that may feed into a going concern issue. So that's socio environmental auditing. On then to prospective financial information. This is covered by our 
ISA 3400, the examination of prospective financial information. So what are we actually talking about here? We're talking about, first of all, maybe a forecast, which will be based on assumptions, say expected events, and then the actions taken in response to those expected events. Now, forecast will tend to be for periods less than one year. So it's based on expected events, but events that are very likely to happen. A projection on the other hand, well this is a hypothetical assumption that's saying well you know this may happen or that may happen and then making the projections based on those assumptions. These will generally be a bit longer term, so two to five years and won't be as reliable as forecasting. may also be a hypothetical illustration which again will be less reliable or it may simply be a target and you may have to go in as an auditor and say did they meet the target or is it realistic. So why do we have a, or why may prospective financial information be produced? Well, maybe internal management looking for just some forecasts as to what to expect in the next period, or it may be for third parties, for a prospectus, for example, or for the annual report. So those are the sort of areas that this will be produced for. How is it prepared? So management will prepare it, but how do they go about doing that? So they'll make those assumptions that we talked about, for example sales increases or the likely costs. They'll then determine what accounting policies they use at the minute and make sure that the information is consistent with those. So the prospective financial information must be consistent with the accounting policies they currently use. They'll then prepare the financial information using the assumptions that they have made and the policies as well. They'll then issue the information and disclose all the assumptions and all of the policies that they have made very clearly. So where does the auditor come into this? Well the auditor may then be called in to say, look, we need to get some assurance that this prospective information is realistic. So accepting an engagement along that sort of lines, well you have to consider a few things. First of all, the intended users. If third parties are going to rely on this, well as we know from our liabilities lecture, you need to be very careful. It'll be much more risky if third parties are going to rely on it. So you need to be sure as well who it's going to be distributed to, because if it's distributed to a wide base of people, then again that's going to be risky. You need to look at the nature of the assumptions that have been made. If, are they forecast or are they projections? Is there uncertainty? What basis have they made these on? If their best estimate, is that estimate reasonable? If they're hypothetical, is it valid? You then need to look at the elements that have been included. Have you got knowledge over those elements? And do you understand everything that's been included? You also have to look at the period involved. Remember, if it's short term, then that's much more easy to predict. But if it's over a long term period, well then the, the predictions are going to be a li li little less uh, re reliable. So procedures then when you're looking at PFI engagements, you need to really understand the business, you need to know what's going on and if you've got low knowledge you'll have to do more procedures. You'll need to look at the management assumptions, are they reliable, are they realistic, is the prospective financial information consistent with all the other information that you know about the business and is it all arithmetically accurate, absolutely crucial. Get management representations for completeness to make sure that they have given you all of the information that you require. Also to make sure that the assumptions that they have made are suitable and that they have taken responsibility for actually preparing the uh, prospective financial information. Also you need to know what the intended use is for the information. So reporting under ISA 3400, you need to have the title, the date and the addressee. Reference to that standard the basis of your opinion, the information that's been included, and a statement of management responsibility. It'll also make clear reference to the purpose and the distribution, basically to limit your liability. It'll give clear limited assurance that the assumptions are reasonable, that the report has been prepared on the basis of those assumptions, and that it's been prepared in accordance with the relevant standards. If there are any caveats, well then you've got to put those in there, for example the limitations of audit procedures. And lastly, the name, address and signature of the auditor. 
So that was a recap of our lecture on assurance services.